tonight, as you know, uh, our topic is beyond uh, NATO. Uh, the question of the uh, security, an alternative security architecture for Eastern Europe. And all of us are well aware that many, many people uh, have a serious concern with the hope for accommodation with Russia in the long run. And uh, an enormous number of people are very sensitive to the aggressive uncertainties of Russian foreign policy today. And uh, an assertiveness which really uh, uh, not only occurs, it, well, it's manifested in a certain extent just by the straightforward vigor of uh, the endeavor to uh, solidify relations with countries bordering uh, Russia, a lot of the former Soviet Union, but obviously an expansion in the Middle East, and, uh, and even more obviously, uh, the uh, taking over of Crimea and the incursion into eastern Ukraine. Uh, obviously, the remarks this evening will deal with that most uh, timely uh, and serious question. Uh, most of you know Michael O'Hanlon. He's a good friend of this council. He may not remember it, but this is the ninth time he's spoken to this council. <laughs> the first time was in 2011. So he's averaged every two years since 2011. The topics covered have been many, including a treatment of the Obama foreign policy, an early one of North, uh, North Korea. In any case, his specialization at the Brookings Institution, where he's director of foreign policy research, has been on defense policy, national security, and American foreign policy, and he certainly has covered the waterfront of those issues. He's the author of more than a dozen books, authored and co-authored, uh, in that range of responsibilities. Uh, since 9-11, he's appeared on radio t or television 3,000 times. <laughs> he's written at least 200 op-ed pieces, dozens in the Washington Post and the New York Times. So you certainly, uh, those of who, you who are indeed attentive citizens, uh, know him quite well from, uh, from that background. Uh, He's a product of Princeton, where he received both a bachelor and a mass, uh, bachelor of science degree, master of science in the physical sciences, before getting his PhD uh, in public and international affairs from the Woodrow Wilson School. Uh, he was a Peace Corps volunteer, uh, has had interesting assignments in the security and budget area prior to uh, the Brookings Institution, where he now is a, a central figure. Uh, we couldn't ask for a much more experienced, thoughtful, and dedicated student of these things than Michael O'Hanlon. It's my great pleasure to introduce him. Michael. Thank you, everyone. What a privilege to be here, and what a beautiful night. And this is my favorite council. I've been privileged to speak around the country. The energy and the expertise and the excellent questions, which I'm already a little scared of for this topic, <laughs> are, are always really, really riveting and, and provocative and useful uh, for anybody who's trying to think through their own ideas and, and express them and, and get some feedback. So I appreciate the opportunity. I, I noticed when, when I came in, some of the chairs by the window were turned the other way. So I hope not too many turn in the course of the evening but I'll, I'll forgive you if you do because it's a gorgeous night yet again in Baltimore. And by the way, I also want to get just, let's just get it on the table that even though this is one of those rare moments when Washington sports teams are doing better than Baltimore sports teams, it gives me, gives me no satisfaction whatsoever because I'm more of an Orioles fan and more of a Ravens fan personally. So I'm with you on that too. But, but uh, I, I do want to talk about Beyond NATO. And this is a short book that I wrote through Brookings just published over the summer, in which I basically make the case that NATO has expanded far enough. And not that NATO expansion, which has really picked up since the Cold War ended, as many of you know, and I'll come back to that, not that it's badly intended, not that it's failed to have some real accomplishments, and not that it should be blamed fundamentally for the state of U.S.-Russia relations. That's fundamentally Vladimir Putin's issue. And I don't like the guy, and I have nothing good to say about him. Let me get that on the table as well, right up front. But I do think that to the extent we have some control over the temperature and the tone and many of the dynamics in U.S.-Russia relations today, that this ongoing 
process of pushing the alliance that won the Cold War further and further east, closer to Mother Russia, is actually potentially part of the problem. We ought to at least explore whether there is a way to think through uh, maybe changing the dynamic. And again, I'm not trying to blame NATO for what's happened so far. I'm not trying to relitigate previous rounds of expansion. They had their uh, good arguments. Uh, my boss, Strobe Talbot, happened to be one of the important people behind this in the Clinton administration. A lot of very good people have been very serious about using NATO expansion to consolidate democracy, to establish and reinforce civilian control of the military, to give countries that were oppressed under Soviet domination the right to choose their own future and their own security arrangements, uh, the right to give the Baltic states, former Soviet republics, th that same prerogative. And so there were a lot of very noble motives, and I think some good things have been achieved. But I would also submit to you today that we're sort of stuck. And maybe one more way to motivate the topic and give you a sense of why I decided to write the book at this moment is that leave aside where we are these last three years with U.S.-Russia relations, which clearly are very bad, uh, everything from the Russian invasion and seizure of parts of Ukraine to the ongoing Russian buzzing of our aircraft and ships that I think actually increase the chance of war to a non-zero number. But, uh, you know, beyond all that, I think we also have to ask, what, where is the logic of NATO expansion right now? Because for a while we sort of knew what we were doing. The first round was in 1996 under Bill Clinton, and there had been some skepticism by people like Bill Perry, his Secretary of Defense, and Strobe himself about whether this was a good idea. But ultimately the idea of bringing in Poland, and at that time Czechoslovakia, uh, and countries like that into NATO made a lot of sense. And, you know, later on, you know, well, Hungary, and then later on Romania and Bulgaria and the Baltic states, and so forth, because we had another big round in 2002, which led to a formal accession process in 2004. So between those two rounds, we now had 11 more countries in NATO, went from 16 at the end of the Cold War to 27, and now we're up to 29. Just this June, Montenegro joined. So we've actually added 13 countries to NATO since the Cold War ended, almost doubling the number. And what I would submit to you is whatever the logic of all of that up until now, here's also where we stand with the idea. I think we're a little bit stuck. Or to put it differently, we are half pregnant with Ukraine and Georgia. Because one of the things that as a non-European security specialist, I'm not a Europeanist, and some people in this room I realize probably are, because I've met a bunch of you before, and so I'll look forward to some pretty detailed reactions and maybe some uh, detailed critiques uh, once I'm done with my opening remarks. But if you, if you think back over that period of time, we always sort of knew what we were doing with the next round of expansion. There was a delay of a year or two or three from the decision to the actual accession. But in 2008, nine years ago, President Bush and Secretary Rice went to the NATO Bucharest summit, and they wanted to bring in Georgia and Ukraine, but they couldn't persuade the rest of Europe, the rest of NATO, include, and then Canada, uh, that this was a good idea. And there are a lot of reasons people were nervous. Do you really want to get that close to Russia? Do you really want to take in countries that mean so much to Russia? Can we really defend them if they get attacked? Back then, that seemed like a hypothetical question. Today, it seems a lot less hypothetical. But still, NATO's getting further and further away from its roots, from its core big countries with big, powerful militaries. And so a lot of uh, NATO member states had questions about whether we should really bring in Ukraine or Georgia or announce any kind of a path to formal accession. So what did we do? I'm sure some of you remember what happened at the Bucharest summit in the, in the press release. We publicly promised that someday we would bring Ukraine and Georgia into NATO. We told all the world of our intentions, including Vladimir Putin, but we also offered no interim security guarantee no schedule as to when they might be eligible. And by the way, we had a long-standing NATO requirement that if you want to be a member, you have to first resolve all your issues with your neighbors and not have any ongoing conflicts. So when you put all this together, you have created a perfect set of perverse incentives for Vladimir Putin to muck around in Ukraine and Georgia. And guess what? He did. Now, I know a lot of people who will say the problem here was we didn't take them in. We should have taken them in. And you can make that argument. That's not my argument, but one can make that argument. But I have met very few people who know this history who think that the compromise was somehow 
a, a better answer than either polar extreme or that the whole policy really holds together. And now we are nine years later, and there's still no interim or lasting plan for bringing in Ukraine and Georgia. Vice President Pence went to Georgia early in the summer, and he said, I, I felt bad for him, because he, whether he wanted to or not, and maybe he did, but you know, he, he was sort of boxed in. He couldn't walk back the invitation, but he also couldn't really operationalize it, because Georgia's not ready for NATO membership. And by the way, what do you do, I mean, how you bring in a country into NATO, which means a country that you would commit to defend with American lives if necessary, when Russian troops are already sitting on their territory. So it's sort of oxymoronic to think that we can do this now. So we're only going to be able to do it when the problem that it's intended to solve is no longer a problem. So we are in a pretty, so I'm going after the logic of where we stand pretty hard because I want to basically argue tonight that whatever the good motives and whatever the good accomplishments of NATO expansion so far, we have to rethink it at a minimum. And even if you wind up not liking my approach, I hope you'll rethink it because it's also become a little bit of dogma in American foreign policy communities, Republican and Democrat, that NATO should expand as a matter of raison d'etre. We've never had another alliance like that. And we don't have any others like that today, where expansion is somehow seen as inherent to the very purpose of the alliance. Most of our alliances in Asia are bilateral. Our associations in the broader Middle East are case by case, and none of them are formal treaty alliances. Our alliances in South America through the Rio Pact, that's sort of a continent-wide thing, except for a few exceptions like Cuba and Venezuela, but basically it's a pretty, you know, a, a fairly weak structure, not a particularly binding alliance, and we're certainly not looking to expand it. So it's really just NATO, where we have conflated expansion, democracy promotion, you know, the European project, all these things are brought together and I would submit to you, we got a little bit sloppy in the 1990s and early 2000s when there was no real threat to Europe. And we thought that we could use NATO as a vehicle to promote all these other things. And now that we have to remember that its core purpose is Article 5, mutual defense. An attack on one is an attack on all. I think we better remember that's the core purpose. And anytime we bring in a country, we better be ready to send, you know, your kids and my kids to defend it. And one more thing that's, and here I'm just sort of, you can see I'm sort of warming up. I'm going to give you the idea of the, of, of the basic proposal and then a little bit more backdrop and, and look forward to your, your thoughts. Uh, but, but one more thing that sort of got under my skin and made me realize I wanted to write this book is I would talk to Americans who were European security specialists or foreign policy specialists, and they would say, every nation in Europe has an inherent right to choose its own associations, its own alliance, its own security membership. And we have to protect that right. And I said, really? Don't we get a right as Americans to decide who we're going to swear to protect? Since we're pretty much the only country that takes this alliance completely seriously and views an Article 5 commitment as something that's written in blood and that has to be backed up with the blood of our own people if necessary, don't we get a say as to whether we think a given country joining is good for our security and good for European stability? So the logic by which I started to hear these discussions happen, and hopefully this was a case for coming in as an outsider to the debate, because I, I always followed European security, but I wasn't a specialist. It made me a little more sensitive to some of the logic, or as I saw it, the illogic of some of the ideas that were popular in many circles with which I would operate and interact in Washington. Okay, so my proposal is, is very simple. We no longer expand NATO. We certainly keep it where it is. We don't kick anybody out. We continue to back up militarily our commitments to the Baltic states and Poland and all the other new members. The so-called European Reassurance Initiative that we're doing now, rotating battalions through the eastern part of the country, or the eastern part of the alliance, we should continue. We must continue. And we make no apologies to Vladimir Putin that we've expanded so far up until now. But we agree that the currently neutral countries, and I'll list them in just a second, will not be candidates for membership. And as a condition, however, for that, Russia has to agree to get its troops off the country's territories where it's currently occupying. Crimea is a little bit of a, of an, of a complicated issue. We'll come back to that. But every place else, 
Russia has to negotiate agreements that Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova are happy with and agree not to send its forces anywhere else in this neutral zone. And it has to agree that any of these countries can join any other association they want, economic, political, including if and when it's uh, available to them, the European Union. This is not a Yalta II to, you know, to harken back to Roosevelt, Stalin, and Churchill after, or at the end of World War II when they sort of divided up Europe into spheres of interest. It's not a, a Russian zone of special, you know, deferred uh, power or privilege. These countries have to have every sovereign right any other country does. But I would submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, joining an alliance is not an inherent sovereign right of any given country. It doesn't get to join our alliance that we created unless we also think it's good for us. And I think people have forgotten. There's nothing about the UN Charter, nothing about the Westphalian state system going back to 1648, nothing about any other principle of international relations that requires countries to have access to any given alliance. Nobody goes around Asia talking that way. Nobody goes around South Asia and the Indian subcontinent talking that way. Nobody goes around Africa talking that way. It's only in Europe where I think we've gotten a little bit confused about what alliances are for and when you use them. So the deal is no further NATO expansion, provided that Putin gets his forces off these neutral countries' territories, agrees not to reintroduce them, and acknowledges they have every other prerogative to join every other organization they might wish. That's the basic deal that I'm proposing. I think if uh, we were to uh, negotiate this, the way to negotiate it is, first of all, I mean, you, you can declare it as your goal from the, you know, a, a Donald Trump speech uh, someday or a tweet. Uh, maybe a speech is better, but, but, um, but then you negotiate it within NATO first, and then with the neutral countries themselves, and only then Russia. Now, I'm sure there are a lot of people in this room who are already saying, well, you're crazy because the neutral countries aren't going to agree to this. And I will concede right up front that most of the email I get from those neutral countries is not fan mail these days. <laughs> so, uh, and, and Bill Perry, the former Secretary of Defense, who wrote a blurb for my book, um, basically said, you know, I don't really, it was, it, was, it was wonderful, Bill Perry. He was just so honest and direct. And it was the first time I ever had a blurb where the person blurbing was only three-fourths in support of my idea. <laughs> and, and he basically said, you know, this, this proposal may have some costs for some of the neutral countries. They don't get an option that they previously thought they had. But the U.S.-Russia relationship has gotten so bad and so dangerous that we've got to rethink our basic approach. We can't just go on autopilot and, you know, expand NATO willy-nilly and view it fundamentally about democracy promotion or values promotion, we got to think twice about what we're doing here. And I would also suggest, as I mentioned earlier, that even though in theory the neutral countries think they might have an option to join NATO right now, Ukraine and Georgia really don't. And they're not going to get it while Putin's president. Now, the next president of Russia could be just as bad as Putin or worse, because, I mean, one thing about Putin, he's at least pretty smart, and he usually figures out when he's gone too far in terms of when he's going to get a reaction that he can't tolerate. The next Russian president could be reckless and equally nationalistic and violent. So it could get worse. But my point is, is if we're trying to solve partly a Putin problem here, NATO expansion is not going to be the answer. Because I don't know of anybody who's proposing that we put Ukraine and Georgia on a specific path certain for a specific date to membership. Maybe some of you would prefer that. I'll look forward to the thoughts. I don't know of any major American uh, political figures who are saying that right now. So we all have conceded that this is at best a long-term hypothetical option. But it is true, I'm proposing that we take it away. However, I'm proposing we take it away through a negotiation that starts with our own allies and then with the neutral states and only eventually goes to Russia. And I'm also insisting that if there ever were a deal, it would have to involve a acceptable resolution of the Donbas issue in eastern Ukraine, the northern territories of Georgia, known as Abkhazia and South Ossetia, where Russia currently has troops, and the Transnistria region of Moldova, where the Russians there, the Russian-speaking citizens of Moldova may or may not want the troops. That part of Moldova is actually, I think, doing a little better than the rest of the country. So maybe that's a situation where the local population doesn't mind having a small Russian presence. But it has to be a mutually acceptable negotiation or there can't be any deal. And then there has to be some verification 
We have to have ways of responding. If there are small Russian transgressions, which I would expect, even if this thing is negotiable, I expect Russia will still try to cheat. And I don't expect that it will resolve every issue in U.S.-Russia relations. So we've got to be expecting that and know how to respond in kind. And then we've got to make it clear to Russia, if the cheating gets too egregious or too harmful to the countries involved, the whole deal is off. And if and when the whole deal is off, we may bring them into NATO faster than we would have otherwise. So that's the basic proposal I want to put forth to you tonight. And let me just, before, uh, I'd, I'd rather go into a discussion sooner rather than later on this, partly because I know how much expertise there is in the room. And there are a number of countries that are going to be involved or who have been part of this expansion process so far. And again, I know there's expertise from different parts of Europe in the room. So let me first mention which countries I'm talking about and then just give you a little bit of how I, I think Russia has started to see this issue with time what I think motivates Russian behavior today. Not that I'm trying to excuse it or sympathize with it or condone it, but I think we have to try to get inside the head of Putin, so to speak. But anyway, I haven't said yet what the countries that I'm talking about are, so let me be very explicit. Starting in the north of Europe, in the Nordic zone, Sweden and Finland. As you know, they're not in NATO. They have long traditions of neutrality. They are in the European Union already, however. So they're, they're the only countries of this type, of, of this swath that I'm looking at who are, or which are already within uh, the European Union. And they're also, of course, basically up to our standard of living, if not ahead of it in some ways. So they are the most successful economically and in terms of quality of life, I think it's fair to say. Moving down, you then come to the three countries in sort of the center of Europe. And of course, that's Ukraine, by far and away the biggest and most populous country that I'm talking about here tonight and also Belarus and Moldova. So those are the three that are sort of in the center. Then we go down to the Caucasus region, which by the way, is almost entirely out of Europe. The Caucasus are mostly in Asia. Here's another problem in our thinking. The North Atlantic Treaty, the Washington Treaty of 1949, which undergirds NATO, talks about North America and Europe as the zone of relevance. And we seem to forget that in somehow thinking that it's reasonable to talk about expanding NATO to Georgia. Now, there may be Georgians in the room. I should hasten to say, as an American who's visited our forces in Iraq and Afghanistan and had that privilege, I've seen Georgians in both places fighting as a coalition and sacrificing and losing people as a coalition because we asked them to. We have a moral debt to Georgia, and I'm not going to suggest otherwise. And I think it's important we try to take care of Georgia in any kind of arrangement. But I would also submit to you the place we're at right now is not taking very good care of them because, again, we said we want to bring them in someday in 2008, but no interim security guarantee, no path to membership, and uh, a reminder that if you want to come into NATO, you have to first resolve territorial disputes with your country, w with your neighbors, all, all neighboring countries. And it was exactly four months after that Bucharest summit when Putin invaded Georgia. I'm not suggesting we caused it. I'm certainly not suggesting we're responsible for it in any moral or strategic sense, but it's still an inter interesting coincidence to bear in mind. So the Caucasus region is the third major region, and it's, of course, Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. And then finally, uh, as we keep going down, um, we go to uh, the Mediterranean region and the Balkans. So most of the Balkans are already in NATO at this point, but Serbia is not, Kosovo is not, Kosovo is not widely agreed to be a country, the United States recognizes it, uh, Russia still thinks it's part of Serbia, it's not really resolved. And then Macedonia has what's called the Membership Action Plan, which means it does have a specific path and schedule for joining NATO. And Bosnia is close to that. But um, otherwise, what I would propose is that Cyprus in the Mediterranean and the rest of the Balkans that don't have membership yet and don't have these formal maps or membership action plans, that they not be invited in. So again, Sweden and Finland in the north, Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia in the center, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan in Asia, <laughs> drive home that point one more time, and then Cyprus and the remaining Balkan states. These are the places I'm talking about. Okay, so you might ask, and, and this is the last part of my uh, set of opening remarks and then look forward to the discussion. You might ask, why do I think this is actually going to solve any problem anyway? 
do I really think that Putin's such a poor, misunderstood guy that if we just deal with his one little malaise or unease or paranoia that all of a sudden he'll get nice again? Of course not. Uh, of course, I, I know that about Putin. I will quickly tell you, by the way, though, that Russians that we've, that we've found a lot more uh, reasonable over the years, starting with Mikhail Gorbachev and going down a long list of other pro-Western reformist Russian politicians almost universally have, ex have opposed NATO expansion too. And some of them even felt it was a betrayal. Now, I'm not going to go so far as to say we promised not to expand, but you may recall the first President Bush and Secretary Baker, they spent a lot of time when the Cold War ended trying to negotiate the terms under which Germany would be reunified. And one of the things we said to, to Russians, at that point they were still Soviets because the Soviet Union didn't fall apart until 1991. But one of the things we said is that we will not put NATO troops in East Germany. And we spent a long time talking about that, the former East Germany. And so implied in that is if you're not going to put forces in the former East Germany, it, it's sort of the same spirit to think you're not going to put them in Poland or the Baltic states either, which are a lot further east. Now, in, again, in fairness to American foreign policy, we never did put major combat forces in those new members, but we did bring them into NATO. And we started to do exercises and rotations. And today we have begun to put forces in because now we're afraid of their own security because of Russian behavior. I'm not criticizing that. As I said, I endorse that. But if you were a Russian, you'd say, well, Bush and Baker spent a lot of time being very sensitive to our concerns about what NATO's relationship would be with East Germany. Obviously, you knew we cared about the alliance that defeated us in the Cold War coming closer and closer to our borders. And now you're a thousand miles further east and you're surprised that we're pissed off. So um, I think when you look at this through Russian eyes, you have to say uh, that it's not just Vladimir Putin. It's a lot of Russians who felt that this was almost an insult. Not all of them really think it's a military threat, and I don't think we've posed a military threat. We've made a lot of efforts to reassure Russia. We've created a lot of dialogues, invited them to a lot of NATO activities, created the NATO-Russia Council, uh, made sure we didn't put a lot of forces to the east. You know, I think we've gone out of our way to try to reassure Russia in terms of military threat. But in terms of psychology, that's a different thing. And maybe this seems like a funny thing to talk about in a foreign policy address, but I'm not trying to be some, you know, pop, uh, political science-y psychologists blending multidisciplinary multi multi approaches to try to sound all sensitive. I want to remember Thucydides. Thucydides, the great uh, scholar of ant antiquity, talked about how there were three things that motivate human beings in international relations. And there's interest, or greed. There's fear. So, so far it sounds a lot like the stock market, you know. But, but, but there's also, and, and this is where Fewer of us care about this particular emotion when we're dealing with our stock, but countries care a lot. Honor. And if you feel that you were a great power, and now your face is being rubbed in the sand by the former adversary, because it's taken the alliance that it defeated you with and doubled its size and moved it a thousand miles closer to you, I would submit that even a few Americans might be upset by that if the roles were reversed. So I'm cognizant of that psychology, even as I admire what NATO's been trying to do, and I recognize its accomplishments. So um, Putin has a lot of beefs with us, and I think that some of them are probably manufactured for reasons of Russian domestic politics, but most of them are sincere. I mean, they're nonsense, but they're sincere. And I think we have to ask, okay, is there anything that's reasonable that we can do it doesn't harm our interests, doesn't harm the interests of our allies or our friends that might deal with the more reasonable objections of Putin. And I think his objections fall into three broad categories, and I'll just I'll finish with this and look forward to the discussion. And NATO is certainly about uh, the center of one of these three categories. But let me come to that last. Putin definitely thinks that we have, for one thing, been a bumbling hyperpower that's sort of out of control, that we enjoy running the world and we use this fancy language and this, these wonderful inspired words of human rights and freedom and democracy to promote uh, our interests. But lo and behold, we make huge mistakes and for him exhibit A is probably the Middle East. 
where he would say America has exercised enormous power in the last 16 years and the region's a lot worse off. And I'm not here, you know, I, I supported much about Iraq and Afghanistan, not every element, but I'm not here to criticize those policies per se. But I would acknowledge, and probably a lot of you would too, that the results haven't been so good and that there were cases where we took a UN Security Council resolution or a legal principle or a moral argument and we took it pretty far <laughs> and we overthrew Saddam or we overthrew Gaddafi and we always said that wasn't necessarily our goal with Gaddafi, but Putin's like, come on, you guys, you got me to sign a UN Security Council resolution authorizing the protection of innocent people in Libya in 2011 and next thing I know, you're overthrowing Gaddafi. It's just what you Americans do. And maybe you, know, you take a little bit of permission and you enlarge it. And by the way, maybe I could forgive you if Libya were a shining example of a stable country today. But it, somehow you seem to repeat the same mistake there that you did in Iraq, and you sort of assumed the best would follow the overthrow of a dictator and didn't really have a good plan for how to do it. So that's part of why he ultimately intervened in Syria, I think, as well. And I don't condone Russian behavior in Syria for a moment, however, he watched us stumble and bumble around. Half the time we want to overthrow Assad, half the time we don't. Half the time we got an arms program that's serious about trying to do so. Other times we're backing away from it, withdrawing it. And meanwhile, the country falls into complete disarray. We're not doing the killing. Putin is doing the killing. He's the one carpet bombing neighborhoods, or his ally Assad is. But nonetheless, we were present at the creation of that conflict in Putin's mind. And you can see why he would make that argument. That we, we sort of wanted Assad to be replaced, but we didn't really provide the means to our allies to do it, and the place just sort of gradually simmers and then blows up over a period of years. So category number one of Putin's problem with us is that he thinks we're both, it's, it's sort of a number of things, but he thinks we're basically a bumbling superpower. We're a combination of arrogant, incompetent, and uncontrolled. <laughs> and you know, there are, there are some American foreign policy critics in our own country who make similar arguments. And a lot of us who can at least see why some of that might be articulated. That's problem one. Although it probably came a little bit later than, than the NATO issue, and I'll come back to that. Problem two is that we also mucked around closer to home for Putin and the so-called colored revolutions, where we promoted civil society and opposition candidates and democratic reforms in Georgia and Ukraine and even the former Stans region of Central Asia and the so-called tulip and rose and orange revolutions. And we did it all to our mind, and I think this is true, we did it transparently and above board. But of course, Putin didn't believe that. He was sure that for every, you know, Voice of America transmission, there was a secret CIA messaging. Remember, Putin's a KGB guy himself. And he was sure that for every above the board help for an opposition movement or just for a civil society organization that's trying to promote transparency and dialogue that we're given secret bags of cash to the people who are anti-Russia. And there may have been a couple of cases for all I know where Putin's right. Not because the people were anti-Russia, but because we wanted to see former dictators challenged. And we knew the dictators had control over a lot of resources, and we wanted to help. Um, now, I think the overwhelming percent of what we did was above the board and through civil society and through open appropriations and organizations like the National Democratic Institute and the International Republican Institute. But Putin didn't see it that way and wouldn't believe us if we said that was all we were up to. So that's the second beef. And I'm not suggesting we fundamentally change that. But the third beef that Putin's had is what I've been talking about all night that NATO kept expanding, and this is the very organization that defeated Soviet power during the Cold War. And Russia and Putin, these are nationalistic people. Uh, we Americans should at least understand that. We're pretty nationalistic too. And when you're nationalist, even if it was a bad system, a communist system, a Soviet regime that you no longer uh, respect and you no longer want to bring back, it was still your people. It was still, you know, your history. And so NATO was the enemy even of post-Soviet Russians in the minds of a lot of people. And I think what brought it home to me as much as anything was when I heard this 35-year-old Russian woman make this argument at an event we had at Brookings a couple of years ago, Victoria Panova. You can still Google it or look on it on our website if you want. And 
it's really uh, poignant to listen to her because she went to high school in the United States during the 80s, during Glasnost and Perestroika. She had no particular reason. She was not a Brezhnevian. You know, she's tall and beautiful and looks a little bit like a uh, Russian tennis star. And, you know, she's just, and she speaks perfect English and she's brilliant. She's got a PhD. And she said, you Americans rubbed it in our face when you won the Cold War. And then I had a student at uh, Syracuse a couple of years ago, a, a Russian former intelligence officer, about 28, 30 years old. And all term, he was expressing his concerns about Russian foreign policy and Russian internal policy. But then we had a discussion at the end of the semester and we were talking about great people on the international stage and he raised his hand and he said, Vladimir Putin. And all of us said, what? What are you talking about? Vladimir Putin, you've been spending the whole semester criticizing him. And he said, yeah, but by any fair definition of greatness, Putin's the one guy who stabilized the collapse of Russia. That you Americans love Gorbachev and Yeltsin. We Russians don't love those guys because they presided over the collapse of not just Russian power, but the Russian state and the Russian standard of living. And Putin at least leveled it off. And so anyway, when you put all this together, I think you, you have to go back to Thucydides' concept of honor and think through whether the psychology of where our Russian uh, partners or friends or potential enemies, again, where they are today uh, has some complex roots. And it doesn't mean we should kowtow to those. It doesn't mean we should appease those. I've been, I've been accused of appeasement with this proposal. I don't think it's appeasement because I don't think these countries are getting into NATO anyway. And I think my idea is actually better for them than the current policy. Uh, but I'm trying to underscore, I'm not here to try to somehow defend Vladimir Putin, but we do have to understand where Russia has gone through its history, through its mental evolution, even in the post-Soviet period when they went through a period of extreme weakness and near collapse under Yeltsin. We Americans loved Yeltsin because he did sort of our bidding. Russians didn't. And so even if Putin is a guy who's killed Russian dissidents or had, his, had Russian dissidents in prison and maybe even killed, even if he's a guy who's squelched opposition, even if he's now led to, taken actions that have led to the imposition of sanctions that have led to negative growth rates in the Russian economy, he still has a lot of political capital to live off of in terms of many Russians and how they view him. So without trying to defend him, I would recognize that and I would argue that he is a, a person whose position in power in Russia today is pretty well established and within Russian minds pretty legitimate and we're going to have to deal with him at some level and we can't wish him away. He's almost certainly going to win re-election again next year. So that's why this proposal I would hope we could put on the table. We do, have, we do have a few little issues I won't mention here. I'll just go to discussion, but little issues like how could Donald Trump plausibly be the president who would put this idea on the table, given all that we went through last year with the elections and all the people who are under investigation and what it would look like. So even though I'm not a Trump supporter, maybe I'm trying to do him a tiny little favor. Not that I have any reason to think he supports this plan, uh, but I do think we need to look beyond all the scandals of Russia to think fundamentally and strategically about if there's anything we can really start to do, not to create a new detente. We're not going to ever like Vladimir Putin. We're not going to ever have a good relationship with him, but we do need to make sure we don't go to war with him. And so on that stark note, I'll finish. I look forward to your thoughts and questions. Okay, why don't I start over here, please, and then we'll work back over this way. There is a rich literature and debate about this question. I'll repeat the question, which is, didn't we promise at the end of the Cold War never to bring in former Warsaw Pact or especially former Soviet republics into NATO? I have to say, I, I think the answer is no, we did not make the promise, but we ha gave a lot of body language that suggested that we understood uh, that Russia was very sensitive to this question. That's why I went through the Bush-Baker discussion earlier. I have a wonderful colleague named Steve Pfeiffer who totally disagrees with me about my proposal, uh, but he does it in the most fair-minded and extremely well-informed way. He was U.S. ambassador to Ukraine at the turn of the century, wrote a very good book on U.S.-Ukrainian relations, which I recommend to all of you. And, uh, and th there's a blog that he wrote on the Brookings website, which I have no reason to doubt or challenge at all, in which he gets at this issue. And I think you know, he persuades me that there was no such promise. But I, so I, I don't try to claim there was. I don't think we broke a promise to Russia, and I don't want to go into a negotiation apologizing to Russia for anything. 
The minute we do that, Putin's got us. And then even if the whole concept doesn't work, and, and the treaty is never negotiated, or it doesn't even have to be a treaty, it could be a, an agreement, then he's going to be trying to figure out, okay, which allies are you most sorry about having brought in? And therefore, which ones can I mess around with? So I think we have to, if my idea were to ever get seriously considered, we would have to be very emphatic to Russia. This is not an apology, but it's a recognition that where we are now is not good for either country. We're sort of stuck in a process that we still believe was well-intentioned and even potentially good for Russia. But you, Russia chose to view it differently, and we have to recognize that as a reality. So that's the way I would make the negotiation happen, or that's the tone I would try to interject. And I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't start viewing it as a chance to apologize to Russia for any broken promises, of which I don't think there were any anyhow. So the question's about Sweden, and whether Sweden should be in NATO, should have the choice to be in NATO. And if we have any Swedish diplomats, I'm sure we have some Swedes in the room. If we had have any, almost as many Swedes as there are Irish around in the United States. So, you, <laughs> but, um, so I'm sure other people may want to engage on this topic. I think, however, you summarize the situation very well, which is basically in Sweden today, there is more of a debate about NATO membership than ever before. And it's a very, it's, it's maybe somewhere between 50, 50, 40, 60, 60, 40. It's a shifting issue. I think Sweden has elections next year where this is actually one of the subjects uh, of heated debate. And so it's uh, you know, a topic where Sweden does feel a need to consider this collectively much more than they have before. And uh, they haven't decided to propose it. I do think if they proposed it, we would have a hard time saying no to Sweden. Um, but I still hope they won't ask. And the reason is the following, because if an, I think Sweden and Finland in a way are the linchpins of my whole proposal. Because if they can believe in this enough, that they revert back to their preferred historical approach of neutrality, then that suggests that they recognize that where we've been in the dynamic of the interaction the last 20, 25 years is part of what's caused the problem. And if we can sort of change that dynamic, they can perhaps return back to what has historically been their preferred policy. I think the last numbers I saw, like 45% or 40% of Swedes favored NATO membership and 30% of Finns, but much higher numbers than previously. And it could go above 50% in Sweden, certainly in the near term. So I think you're right to highlight that as a different case. A lot of people would say, well, why don't you go ahead and bring in Sweden and Finland? They're already doing more with NATO anyway, especially Sweden. And I would say, well, that's true. And if Sweden joined, I wouldn't have a huge problem. But let me put it this, this way to you as well. Again, if, 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 if Sweden and Finland want to join NATO, how is a Georgia or Moldova or Ukraine going to feel about, you know, really believing in this new security architecture? I think it sort of shoots my idea down. If, even if you don't care about that, from a Russian point of view, if you look at their holdings within the Baltic Sea region, you know, we think of the Baltic Sea, at least I sort of in a sloppy way thought of the Baltic Sea as just sort of yet one more appendage of the North Atlantic, sort of like we're in the inner harbor here, you know, and there's an outer harbor and a Chesapeake. and, and but it is sort of like the Inner Harbor. It's basically a lake. The Baltic Sea just has a tiny egress out to the North Sea. And if Sweden and Finland become NATO members, then Russia basically, it's become a NATO lake. And 95 to 97% of the coastline is NATO. And so if we're concerned about this Russian reaction that may be partly paranoid, but is still, I think, real, then I think Finland and Sweden coming in creates more of a sense of encirclement. That's part of why I would try very hard, and I have tried hard already with Swedish and Finnish friends, uh, to, to make the argument that they ought to take this kind of an idea seriously, too. Because without them, I don't know if it can really work. A very good question. Would Putin really buy into this? And you've made me realize there's one more piece that I need to uh, get on the table that I overlooked earlier. Uh, so what would Russia get out of this deal? Well, first of all, I should have said earlier, I apologize, it gets a lifting of economic sanctions. Because we're presupposing as part of this a resolution of the Donbass, a resolution of South Ossetia and Abkhazia. If we don't find a resolution of those that are resolutions that are acceptable to Ukraine and Georgia, there can't be a broader deal anyway. If we do get resolutions to those, there's no reason to keep the sanctions on. So that's one thing Putin would get. And remember, he's popular partly because he stabilized the quality of life in Russia, except now it's deteriorating again. And so just how long can he really afford to play this game, I don't know. Second, we would have to hold our noses and listen to Putin say this, and I wouldn't enjoy hearing it myself. 
but, but if he negotiated this, we'd have to tolerate him going home to his people and saying, I'm the first Russian leader in history to finally stop the West from encroaching on Russian territory. Every previous period in Russian history, at some point or another, they came east. And, you know, Catherine the Great and all the other czars, they couldn't stop it, but I did. And it would pain me to hear Putin be able to have those bragging rights. But, you know, he's pretty good at bragging, and I bet you he could find a way to make that sound pretty good. And um, so that's the second thing he might get. But I still take your broader point, which is he might still say no. And that's part of why you have to think through the negotiating strategy in such a way that we're not giving anything up. We're not stopping the European Reassurance Initiative. We're not pulling forces back from Poland or the Baltic states. We're certainly not uh, hinting in any way, shape, or form that current members would somehow be kicked out of the alliance. We're not apologizing for the history. Uh, we're reinforcing all the accomplishments that we think we've had together uh, in this process. And so uh, we have to go in expecting that Putin might very well say no, because he may either fear the EU expansion just as much as he fears NATO expansion, in which case he'll probably say no to this, or he may want to have us as a nemesis, because if he can get it just right, he can maybe have his economic growth, but also have a bad guy to blame for whatever goes wrong. And he, and he probably sort of enjoys this game of great power risk, you know, that he's playing with us all the time. So maybe he doesn't really want a resolution, for all I know at this point in his life and in his psychology. So um, I think your question is excellent, uh, not only for its specifics, but for the broader point that it raises, which is we have to go into this realizing that it may not work and de devise a negotiating strategy that's not going to leave us worse off if we try it and then it fails. Uh, the question is about is Ukraine doing better in the battlefield? I think they are doing better. They built up their military a bit. We've helped them, not with lethal arms so far, but with other kinds of weapons or other kinds of systems. Other people have helped them with weapons. And they're fighting for their country. I mean, one of the things that Steve Pfeiffer underscores, and he's traveled through Ukraine much more than I have. I've only been once in my life, and it was last winter. Uh, Steve's been, you know, he was ambassador, and he's also traveled in the East since the war began in 2014. And he says Putin always probably looked down on Ukraine as just sort of a, you know, appendage of the Russian state. And what he's done in a way that nobody else had quite done in history is to really strengthen Ukrainian nationalism. And so the Ukrainians, I think, are proud of fighting for their own country. And you know, the, what, what's going on now, many of you are aware of the broad contours of the uh, Donbass fight in the eastern part of Ukraine. I just got a briefing on this along with Steve from the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, which monitors what's going on there, has a lot of people in and about the region. There is still a lot of ceasefire violations. I mean, it's not really a ceasefire, it's a low-grade war. More than 10,000 people have died, and people continue to die every week, more or less. So um, it's not over, but it hasn't expanded geographically. So the question is, what's Putin thinking? Since there are probably seven or 8,000 Russian irregulars who are on Ukrainian territory and then uh, Russian weaponry, uh, obviously Putin could put more into that sector if he wanted to, but then he would have a harder time lying about what he's up to. He might not care because, you know, he'll just try the next lie if he gets caught with the previous one. But, but, um, but right now he can sort of hope the world half forgets. He can sort of hope these European elections that are so unpredictable will finally lead to a, lead to a weakening of sanctions by the European Union, and he won't even have to end the conflict. Meanwhile, he keeps Ukraine weak, and they all know in Ukraine that if he wants to escalate, he could which then prevents them from pursuing NATO membership. So I don't really know exactly what game Putin's playing, but he seems to want the leverage he gets from this limited conflict. If we were to provide lethal arms to the Ukrainian military to help them get even better, then there's two possibilities. One, Putin feels the pain more and looks for an off-ramp, and the other is that he escalates. And I don't know how to predict. I'm not gonna claim I know how to handicap the odds of those two possibilities. So what I would rather see us try to do is see if we can negotiate something like this now before we even have a debate about lethal arms for the Ukrainian military. They have sort of brought this thing to a bit of a stalemate, but it's still ongoing and it's still lethal. Yeah, it's a great question. So um, how do I think about cyber? And it's a, I'll use that to make a broader point, which is I don't expect Russia, I've mentioned a couple of times, I don't expect Russia to become our friend.
And I think some of its bad behavior would, would probably continue in other realms, even if we persuaded Russia not to compete over these Central and Eastern European territories and the Caucasus as well. So on cyber, I assume the Russians will keep it up. I assume as well that we better get more serious about defending ourselves, including our civilian infrastructure. Uh, I think I would make the deal even if they kept trying to play games in our elections, but I would retaliate in other ways. So I would rather view the whole issue of Central Europe as, as one we try to separate off, treat separately, but be ready and not be naive about Russia treating us well or behaving well in other domains. And on cyber, we need to be more prepared to retaliate. And some sanctions, by the way, Putin may get the sanctions lifted in regard to occupying Ukraine and Georgia, but he may suffer new sanctions if further cyber incursions happen in the future that are harmful to us in one way or another. So I think all those things need to be part of the discussion as well when you go into this kind of a proposal. Uh, now, if Russia really did escalate its cyber crime, at the same time it was trying to negotiate this with us, I question seriously whether our political system would tolerate the negotiation. And so I think my idea would probably die in that even if I were prepared to try to separate the two and respond in kind rather than respond by dropping this negotiation, my guess is that the U.S. political system would not tolerate an effort to negotiate a new security order in Europe. At the same time, Russia is continuing to try to manipulate our elections and our democracy. So in that regard, they are linked, and I'm glad you raised it. Yes, sir. So how would people react to my proposal in Europe, in NATO Europe? Uh, we already know how they react in Sweden and Finland and Georgia and Ukraine. No, I, I've gotten about 90 to 10 uh, opposition from friends in, in the neutral countries, just to be fair and in full disclosure. But I also try to push back and say, are you really so happy with where current policy has left you? Uh, and, and then they'll say, well, you know, don't we get the right to choose our own security organizations? Are you depriving us of our sovereignty? And I said, don't I get the right to decide where I want to send my daughters? if they join the army someday, you know, to risk their lives in defense of American foreign policy. So those are the kind of debates I have with the Eastern Europeans. With the, with the NATO countries, I think that the best I can do, and you can Google this if you're interested as well, there's a really interesting survey that the Pew Charitable Trust did, and it was two years ago, so it's getting a little old, but it was a year after the beginning of the, of the war in Ukraine. And they, they asked Europeans and also Americans, and I think Canadians were included as well in the survey, they asked them, would you fight to defend an Eastern NATO member state if it were attacked by Russia? And they also asked, do you favor keeping the sanctions in place as long as Russia is still violating the sovereignty of Ukraine? On the second question, Europeans overwhelmingly said yes, that yes, they would sustain the sanctions. On the first question, they were much more ambivalent. And you saw several European countries that did not have majorities in favor of sending military force to defend a fellow NATO, NATO state once under attack, which you could argue is an outright violation of Article 5 and the basic mutual defense concept of the whole alliance. Although in fairness, in fairness to our European friends, I would say two things. First of all, the, the question didn't specify a scenario. It didn't say if it was, you know, one Russian soldier who was drunk and crossed over and, you know, stole something from a candy store, or if it was a big tank invasion with multiple divisions. And then, um, and, and then secondly, Article 5 itself is a little bit more ambiguous than many of us remember if you actually read the whole thing. And as you probably know, what it says is that in the event of an attack on any member state, all other states will consider all means of response or will, will respond with all means, uh, including the possible use of military force by, ba based on their own assessment of their national interest. In other words, there are a couple of qualifiers and caveats. And what that means is if the incursion is small enough or you think it's reversible, your first response doesn't have to be to bomb uh, the aggressor country. It allows for some situational and circumstantial you know, uh, specificity and nuance. And unfortunately, that can also be a loophole that a country would use to just excuse itself from its obligations. So we don't really know. But I think we should be a little nervous. And getting back to the earlier point about does Article 5 get weaker as it gets pushed to cover more countries, I think we should be at least a little bit nervous about that. So, see, first of all, there are very few people at Brookings who agree with me on this. <laughs>
So um, just to be clear about the, the alignment of forces, I already mentioned Steve Pfeiffer. I won't quote anybody else by name. Well, I did mention Strobe Tall, but he was one of the architects and the implementers of the original round of NATO expansion in the 1990s when he was Deputy Secretary of State. He's now our president at Brookings. He's a fantastic guy. I, I'm, I'm very proud of what he did with those rounds of NATO expansion. I had some reservations at the time, which I wrote about, but I knew that he was genuinely and sincerely and effectively trying to use this tool to consolidate democracy in Eastern Europe. And obviously he worked for Madeleine Albright, who came from that part of the world. And, and so there were some real uh, you know, good motives. I, we, we lost this year Zbigniew Brzezinski. He was in favor, I believe, of the first round, became more skeptical as time went on as well. Uh, so anyway, there isn't really a Brookings view, not that you put it that way, but there isn't, you know, if there were a Brookings view, I'd be on the outs less than I would be in the majority on this question. Um, I will tell you, uh, and uh, you know, since we're in a public forum and so forth, I've actually had more access to Trump administration officials in the last nine months than I've ever had to a Democratic administration in my career, and I'm a Democrat and a Brookings guy. So uh, I'll, I'll at least give them that much credit for uh, open-mindedness and, and dialogue. And then finally, on the issue of whether, despite my praise, for at least some of the Trump administration, uh, please don't take that as a blanket endorsement of <laughs> any and all people or things or ideas within, uh, that I think you're right, it's, it, it's a really hard question. But I guess my job is not to feel stymied before I even get the debate going, or not that I'm getting the debate going, Henry Kissinger got the debate going, Shabig Brzezinski got the debate going, a lot bigger names than myself. But I think you would have to have a number of people who had great stature in this field of foreign policy and of both parties to provide cover on both sides who basically said, yeah, I think we could, I think we could design this in such a way that even if that son of a gun, Putin, behaves the way he normally would and looks for every opportunity and every loophole and then tries to cheat uh, and or maybe doesn't accept it in the first place, that this is still something that's not going to hurt us in the worst case and maybe helps us in the best case. So I think we need to have the debate first. And that's why I was so happy to see Bill Perry endorse it, because even though it was not a full-throated endorsement, it was a willingness to have the debate. And so it's going to take a while, and you know maybe the FBI can finish its work along the way. And so <laughs> maybe next year feels a little different in terms of the possibility of a different US-Russia dialogue. But I'll say this. Again, not trying to defend Donald Trump's geopolitics, but, but his desire to find some way to tone down the temperature in U.S.-Russia relations, with that particular view of Donald Trump, I am in complete agreement. And so I hope that we can find some way uh, to move beyond. It may take a while. Thank you all very much. Well, again, Michael, it was our privilege. We're delighted. Thank you very much. Thank you.